Hi, I'm Michael Killen. Welcome. And my guest today is the former Undersecretary of the Department of De Energy for the United States government, and it's the Department of Science and Energy, and his name is Lynn Orr. And with that, Lynn, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. So it's former Undersecretary, Science and Engineering, the United States Department of Energy. Yeah, close. Uh, close. Former Undersecretary, Science and Energy okay. for the Department of Energy. So. Good. And uh, you got kicked out of there? Well, it, it's, it's normal when administrations change for the uh, top leadership of the agencies to change. And so at noon on January 20th, I had the opportunity to go work on something else. So you were in the Obama administration. Yes. How did you feel when it was time for you to leave Washington, D.C. and come back to the great state of California and Stanford University? Well, there's, there's nothing like a couple of years in Washington to convince you that this is about the best place on the planet to live and work. So uh, I was certainly happy to come back. Uh, I came away with um, uh, a deep respect for a lot of talented people that work at, uh, at DOE headquarters and also at the national labs around the country uh, to support the science and energy research enterprise for the nation. So, uh, and I have to admit, I miss some of those folks, a lot of good people to work with. Good. And what was the most interesting or important work you did? Was it four years? Uh, no, I was. Uh, it took uh, just over a year for me to get through Senate confirmation. Uh, so it was supposed to be a three-year assignment, but it turned out to be only two and just a little bit. Um, and on the, in terms of what, what uh, my overall big assignment was to figure out productive ways to link the, the applied energy programs with the fundamental science project, programs. Uh, but of course, there were many, many pieces of that uh, as, uh, as we worked on the budget and as we tried to build a portfolio of research that made sense for the nation. Uh, just a few of those, for example, we did a, uh, a quadrennial technology review. So we really looked at every uh, technology uh, option out there for finding ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to make our energy systems much more efficient and more productive and to lower the cost of them as well. Um, we worked on um, multiple portfolio plans. I chaired a study of uh, Aliso Canyon and, uh, and what went wrong there uh, and what could be done to prevent that sort of thing uh, in the future. Um, so lots and lots of interesting things across the whole range of what the department does. Would I be correct to say, from your previous experience, you have gained a lot of knowledge, True, accomplishments, yeah. but it would be at roughly this level. But when you were back in Washington, did you start to see the world at a much higher level? Well, what I think, I think I had worked at Stanford previously on our big uh, interdisciplinary energy research uh, initiative that was the same job that the Secretary of Energy had at the, at MIT. So the two of us uh, knew each other. So I was pretty familiar with um, with the range of energy technologies and the and the problems we need to face um, in thinking about how to to make those cleaner. Um, what was uh, 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 more of a stretch for me was the the Office of Science programs. Some of them I knew well from having served on their advisory committees, but uh, uh, there was a lot to learn about there, and, and uh, it was fun. I, uh, I know a lot more about neutrinos now than I did when I went to Washington, I'll tell you okay. that. Okay, and let's see, you went to school in Texas, and am I correct, material science? No, I, I, w I went to high school in Texas, but I, I studied chemical engineering at Stanford as an undergraduate. Okay, so that's pretty fundamental stuff, basically. I mean, we all build upon that. Okay, so now you're back at Stanford. Right. And what are you doing? You're a professor emeritus? I am a professor emeritus. That means that when I get up in the morning, I get to decide what I work on for the day. Um, they were kind enough to give me an office uh, again, and uh, uh, I'll teach a couple of classes, uh, and I'm continuing to work 
uh, with lots of colleagues working on the full range of energy research at uh, Stanford. There's a lot going on uh, at our place and a lot of really talented people and I'm happy to help out here and there when I can. Uh, the two courses you're going to teach, briefly, what, what are they? Um, the one will be a graduate course that's about the mathematics of how fluids flow in the rocks in the Earth's crust. Uh, and the other one will be an undergraduate sophomore seminar probably, uh, uh, something along the lines of one I did before I left, which was called Technology in the Greenhouse. And it's really about all the ways that, uh, that we have to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, associated with energy use. So that's like uh, technology in the world. Yes, of that's, course, it, yes. And you said you're working with a whole group of colleagues right now in various ways, and they're interested. One or two projects that they're working on that you find especially interesting. Well, you know, um, the in the the sort of uh, the years before I went to Washington, uh, we had established the Precourt Institute for Energy, um, and it was designed to bring together uh, about 200 faculty members distributed around the university, working on really every aspect of. Uh, from the fundamental material science to the, the energy policy to energy efficiency. Um, there, uh, I'm uh, continuing to work on uh, topics that have to do with carbon captured storage. Um, I'm working uh, with a former student on a project out in the San Juan Basin looking at how to reduce fugitive methane emissions. Sure. Um, and then, of course, there, there are the endless uh, uh, proposal reviews and presentations for visitors and that kind of thing as well. Okay, so I heard two topics, uh, the future, TIV, you know, uh, emissions that escape out of uh, the wells, out of the production, out of mm -hmm. transit, that would be it? Uh, yeah, actually the, the system that we're looking at now um, is uh, that it, it's associated with an underground, uncontrolled fire in a coal bed. Um, and we went to work to try to figure out how these things work. Turns out they're uh, all around the world. There are lots and lots of them. But in doing so, we discovered that uh, the way the fire is sustained, at least part of it, is from methane that's flowing up through the coal. Um, and that made us go look at the, at the outcrops where the coal is, is exposed to the surface. And there we discovered that in some places there's a, a fair amount of methane that's being released. And so we're working now to quantify that because what we'd like to do is to find ways to control that. So like in Pennsylvania and some other coal stir uh, states, they still have these fires. Yeah, yeah, there's one, decades, one in, I think. yeah, Centralia, um, uh, Pennsylvania that's been burning for, I don't know, it must be close to 60 years now. Um, and uh, there are 33 active fires in Colorado and a whole bunch in Indonesia and India and China. So there, yeah. it's an issue around the world. Are you trying to find a solution to put yeah. the fires out? Yeah, we, uh, we actually worked on a, on a scheme that uh, we were able to show that you could use the fire uh, to draw an inert gas into the combustion zone. Uh, and if you could do that for long enough, you could put it out. Uh, we didn't have enough money to do that on our project. Okay, very interesting. Before I get to a, a main aspect that interests me a lot, on the sequestration of yeah. the carbon dioxide and the methane or whatever, uh, what aspect of that area are you working on or well, interested in? You know, I, I started my career as an engineer working on uh, using high pressure CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Okay. Uh, it turns out that if the reservoir is deep enough and the pressure is high enough, uh, CO2 can displace oil much more efficiently than water can, for example. Um, and then uh, as, and we really figured out the physics of how that works and the chemistry of the, of the flows and, uh, uh, and, and figured out how to model that in considerable detail. And then as time passed, it became clear that we needed to limit the amount of CO2 escaping to the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels or, um, or other activities. And then we began to think about uh, the question of if, if we captured that CO2, where could we put it that it would stay there uh, and what kinds of uh, conditions would be needed and, and, and how would you design that sort of thing. So it kind of involved in, uh, evolved into the the uh, uh, geologic storage of CO2. 
Okay, and then I heard a little while ago the water and the rocks, and that's probably related to that. And the source of the carbon dioxide is from smokestacks? Could be. Um, you know, every day, large quantities of CO2 are separated from uh, natural gas or uh, are separated when uh, fertilizer is made. Uh, so it could be one of those sources. It, it also could come from combustion uh, product gases, uh, whether you're burning coal or, uh, or even methane in a, in a natural gas power plant. Very interesting, and I know you, you like these kind of projects. I do, I, actually. And, and I'd say they are also interesting. Well, I think so, too. I'm glad you shared that. Okay. But I remember, you, you, although your face does light up very easily, which is good, when we chatted about the need to transition to a clean energy economy, right. I think you told me that is an area that you've given a considerable amount of thought to. Yes, it certainly was a key part of my job in Washington, and really it was a driver of my, the, my last 20 years at Stanford as well. Um, uh, we, we would benefit in many, many ways if we transitioned to uh, an energy system that was much cleaner than what we had then and even cleaner than we have now. Um, and there are lots of ways to do this. Um, we can uh, do it with uh, renewables. They've come down dramatically in cost, solar and wind. We can do it with uh, replacing coal-fired power plants, particularly the old, least efficient ones, with natural gas combined cycle plants. Uh, we can do it with uh, judicious use of biofuels. Um, we can do it by, by lots of application of energy efficiency. Um, and we can do it with a, a, a whole host of R&D activities that will provide us with some new options going forward. That we don't know about yet. Well, we, 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 <coughs> and we have plenty of ideas and some of them will work. We just don't necessarily know which ones will be the ones that really pay off in okay. the future. I have a problem of thinking about the transition from mm -hmm. a fossil-based energy economy to the clean one. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a marker at this point in time? Do you, do you look to determine where we are? Do you look at the concentration of greenhouse gases? Certainly, we watch that all the time. This uh, this last year, that's now over 400 parts per million. So that that that's a sobering one. So that's a marker right now. And you're looking into the future. Are you looking at a lower concentration? Well, we, uh, in the end, of course, we would like to get to lower concentrations, but, uh, but we've got we to gotta stop the rise and uh, go over the peak before that will happen. So the marker really right now for you is the amount of greenhouse gases that are being admitted now. And, and I think you folks know how much is going up each year. Are you, for your forecasting out somewhere, the clean economy, do you have a, a amount of carbon emissions that are going up in the air sometime in the future? Would that? Well, you know, the, 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 the thing that makes this hard is that, uh, that it depends so much on the choices we make and what we do. But uh, in rough terms, we, by mid-century, we need to have something like 80% uh, uh, reductions in the, in the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then we need to continue to drive it down from there. Um, and even that still leaves a, a significant probability of in, uh, increased uh, temperature. So that's a big challenge. These are very big systems and there's a, there's a lot to be done, but we have made uh, some good progress recently. Okay, mid-century is not that far away. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, maybe problem for us. Yeah, neither one of us will be there, but it's, okay. uh, it, it's good to worry about. But we're not at the clean economy yet hmm. by 2050? Well, uh, I, you know, I think that depends on your definition of a clean, uh, a clean energy uh, economy. One that had 80% less emissions now would be much cleaner. And you know, we can already see uh, the, uh, the impact uh, in the United States of we have reduced our uh, greenhouse gas emissions over the last uh, seven or eight years. And, uh, uh, 
I mean, we still have lots to do. I don't mean to minimize that challenge, but, uh, but we've come over the peak. Europe uh, is, uh, um, uh, is making progress as well. And China and India have made significant commitments under the, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, which they've said they will stick with uh, even if the United States does in the end withdraw. I listen to you carefully, but I want to be sure at one point. So you know how much emissions are going up right now. And if you can reduce that by 80 percent? Yeah, we're actually t talking about 80 percent versus uh, 1990 emissions. So it's, uh, it's, uh, they've gone up since then, so it's a, a, a bigger amount. How many decades will it take to get into the clean economy? Uh, well, then you'll have to define for me what you mean by the, the, well, the clean energy economy. Well, well, I was... But we're doing some, it now. Some... No, I'd like you to define how much emissions need to drop from, let's say, now to mm. sometime in the future. That yeah, well, we, uh, we, we need to make quite substantial reductions uh, from where we are now. Um, the reason, uh, the reason it's hard to answer your question is that uh, so much depends on, on the choices we make. Some of it uh, is individual choices. How many of us will choose to, to buy and operate an electric vehicle? Will we work hard enough to make the electric power system as clean as we can? Uh, yes. I, we can see a pathway to do that. Um, will we use um, the regulatory authorities in a way that makes that possible? Uh, will we set a price on carbon? Um, all of those things will determine how fast it will be. Uh, and we also need some technology development as well. So there, there's a lot to do and there's so many moving parts that making a specific prediction of which year it will be is, uh, in my view, not possible. Okay. But now that makes me think of California's climate plan, mm -hmm. which I think Jerry Brown has said it's the most ambitious plan in North America, maybe the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a big plan. It is. Yeah. Well, we're a big economy. Uh, California, depending on whose numbers you believe, it's something like the sixth biggest economy uh, in the world. Um, and, uh, and we've shown its power by... Uh, imposing our energy efficiency standards, which have then been adopted by the rest of the country and indeed the rest of the world in many places, um, uh, because companies want to serve those, uh, those big markets. Um, we have made uh, quite uh, uh, impressive inroads in installing uh, uh, solar and wind power, and the costs of those uh, those commodities have come down um, uh, dramatically over the last seven or eight years. Um, we use quite a bit of hydro. Uh, this, in July this year, about half of the, the electricity was generated with natural gas, a little less than half. Um, and the other half came from wind and solar and hydro and nuclear. So b about half of our uh, of our electricity came from very low, um, uh, low uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, resources uh, at that point. So you would say, well, I, you know, that's progress. Yes. Um, we have more to do, but uh, it's definitely progress. Yeah. I looked at uh, the des a description of California's climate change plan, mm -hmm. and I very quickly noticed that it's an identification of targets, targets in terms of industry sectors like agriculture, waste mm -hmm. management, transportation, and a couple of others. So it does identify of the 800 largest emitted, that's another in the state. So they have targets in terms of industries, but then they also have solutions. And you mentioned one, at least, well, you mentioned several, cap and trade. Mm -hmm energy and energy efficiency. And uh, maybe a, a third one that escapes my mind right now. But that seems to me to sort of be the key elements of this California strategy, identification of certain major energy mm -hmm. sectors, and then several different types of solutions. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I haven't found anything to disagree with yet. And I say to myself, that's it. That's the key. That's the, 
the guts of the beast. Yeah, right? I, I, I would say it maybe in a slightly different way, and that is that uh, uh, this is a place where it really is about a portfolio of, uh, of solutions. So on the transportation side, for example, um, uh, first and foremost, there's the efficiency of the vehicles that we drive that still use gasoline and diesel. Uh, and California has the uh, authority, at least for the moment, to, to set its own vehicle mileage uh, standards. Um, it's about uh, electrifying uh, a reasonable fraction of uh, transportation for urban transportation. Electric vehicles, now they're, uh, all of a sudden, there are many manufacturers that have uh, uh, at least a plug-in hybrid version uh, and, uh, and a smaller number uh, a pure electric vehicle. Um, so that means no emissions on the vehicle, but it imposes a really big responsibility with regard to the way we make the electricity that, uh, uh, that goes in them. If you make that at a coal-fired power plant, that's n at least no better than, uh, uh, than um, uh, a gasoline vehicle. So clean electricity, uh, electrifying transportation, looking at, uh, uh, at uh, clean fuels or uh, low carbon fuels, using more biofuels uh, in that is another component of that. And then there's the industry side. Um, we have lots of industry in the state and uh, the, each, each different, uh, you know, uh, a refinery is different from a cement factory is different from a, a manufacturing operation of another sort. So each of those needs to be looked at in its own way. And, a, and the cap and trade system, what that does is to provide a financial incentive for, uh, for companies uh, to, to go after reducing their own emissions so that uh, they can uh, uh, sell the, the, uh, the uh, or if they need to, buy uh, the ability to emit. So it's just a market mechanism for setting a price on, uh, on the emissions. So you pretty much have gone over a fair number of the solutions and, and things associated with the plan. And I, this is a hard question. This is a question, and I'm not sure it's even a good question. What's the most important aspect of California's climate plan? Mm -hmm. so I, would, I would say that it's the breadth of the portfolio that, uh, you know, there's no single simple solution to the, to the climate and greenhouse gas issue. Uh, and that's not the only reason for doing this. It's uh, in terms of health effects and uh, emissions of other pollutants. There are a lot of good reasons uh, to do this, and not the least of them is economic competitiveness. Um, you know, a clean energy system will generate lots of jobs, uh, and it will uh, make us economically competitive in a way that, uh, that we should lead the world. I mean, we can do that. Okay. Um, I had another thought, another question. Um, if I'm the head or high-level official in another country, and if I looked at California's climate plan, um, what would be the most important aspect that I should grab onto and try to get my country or my state. As, as you know, maybe a third, I don't know, of the states don't have a climate action plan. Maybe not that high as a third, but what's the most important thing, do you think, for let's say Alabama, Tennessee? Well, I would say that the, the situations are different in each of the states. They'll have their, uh, their current uh, mix of energy resources that they use. Uh, and uh, a set of ways that they can address those. The, the key elements of the plan are creating a market mechanism uh, and then adapting components within that for each of the sectors that make sense in a particular setting. So, so I think the overall structure uh, and some of the tools that are being used are, are transportable, but they'll need to be put together in a, in a different mix. So creating a market structure, mm -hmm. that is, uh, very important. And it then is. once you have the market structure, then you can talk to the suppliers in, in the area and, and even the users, because I think markets are, are uh, a function of customers or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, very interesting. And you know, we have about two minutes left. You talked a lot. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, so, I, that's what I'm not getting paid for, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you've been wonderful. Uh, can we just end maybe with the benefits that the great state of California is getting from having an effective climate change plan. And we'll start with health. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, jobs. Jobs. Growth of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, less dependent on foreign suppliers for fuel. And you got some more? Well, sure. I mean, uh, if you think about uh, the, the world is going to invest uh, something like uh, 60 trillion dollars in energy infrastructure uh, between now and 2040. Uh, and a whole bunch of that is going to be for clean energy. Those are markets that we should compete in and serve and, uh, uh, and, uh, and lead the way. Um, and it also gives us a chance to work in our universities and national labs on all kinds of exciting uh, uh, research for the future. Okay, that's interesting. Now, in September of uh, uh, 2018, California is going to have its big climate global action plan, and we have about a minute. What do you think is going to happen there? Well, I think uh, Jerry Brown is uh, going to have a starring role, um, and deservedly so, uh, that he's, uh, he's done a good job. And, the, you know, the legislature and a lot of people have all contributed to that. Um, and I think, uh, I think they will show that uh, the United States, even if the federal government withdraws from the Paris Agreement, uh, we've got a pretty good shot at, uh, uh, at uh, delivering uh, better than what, what President Obama promised uh, in places like California. So I think that demonstration is as important as anything uh, that could be done. Okay, so I want to start thanking you for being here. I feel it's an honor. I've learned a lot, and uh, I just want to share in part for the audience because I think you know that this part of our deal here is for you to help educate me because I am painting mm -hmm. climate change, uh, the state's California climate plan, plan. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's a bit of a task even figuring out how to cut this. I want to thank you, Lynn. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest is Lynn Orr. He is the former Undersecretary of Science and Energy for the United States Department of Energy. Now he's at Stanford. He has about 20 other accomplishments, but um, we're not going to go over them. Again, I'm Michael Killen.